out there about natural and artificial sweeteners. So this is a really great topic to kind of dispel some of those rumors that you've heard out there. So um, basically today we'll go over what sugar is, and um, we'll go over nutritive and non-nutritive, and I'll go over what those terms are, and then some practical uh, applications once we go over the different types of you can actually incorporate them into your diet and, and make sure that they um, are healthy. So what is sugar? Basically, the term we use in our culture, sugar, I mean, it can mean a lot of different things, but basically we're referring to sweet, short-chain carbohydrates. So, short-chain meaning monosaccharide, I don't know if you guys have heard that term before, it means there's one sugar. Um, fructose, glucose, and lactose are one sugar, okay? They don't have anything else attached to it, they're not multiples together. Fructose, you find in fruit. Um, glucose, that's what everything breaks down to. No matter what kind of carbohydrate you eat, it'll eventually end up being glucose in your blood. And then galactose is a sugar that we find in milk. Um, and then disaccharides means there's two sugars together. So we've got the simple sugars up here, um, and then so sucrose is fructose and glucose together. So two sugars together. Uh, maltose is two glucose together. And then lactose, which is the sugar you find in milk, is galactose and glucose together. So we're going to talk about when we look at a regular sweetener, um, like sugar, what is that? What is, um, you know, honey? What are those made up of these different sugars? Again, everything, no matter if it's a really complex carb that we find in bread, all comes down to sugar eventually in our blood. So sugar intake, we know in America there's tons of sugar everywhere. You've got it in sodas, you've got it in cakes, cookies, pies, and in things that you don't even think about. Um, most Americans eat about two, 22 teaspoons of added sugar a day. And that's about 350 calories. So that's a lot of sugar. I put a picture over there of a half a cup of sugar. That's 22 teaspoons of sugar, roughly. Is a half a cup of added sugar in your diet every single day. So the reason we care about sugar is it ends up leading to insulin resistance, which then leads to diabetes. Um, heart disease is actually related to excessive intake of sugar. And um, fatty liver disease is seen when there's a lot of uh, excess fructose in the diet. So sugar doesn't just go into our bodies and we just burn up the calories or we gain weight. Things happen to our bodies when we take in too much sugar. Uh, sweeteners, so there's two different kinds of sweeteners. We have nutritive sweeteners, and the term nutritive means it's giving us calories and it's giving us nutrients when you eat them. Um, most of the sweeteners we'll talk about in a bit that are nutritive have four calories per gram, okay? Um, and they give us a lot of vitamins and minerals with it depending if they're not too processed. Um, and the way they end up in our food is either they're naturally occurring, like sh uh, sugars and fruit, they're naturally there when you pick them off the plant, um, and sometimes they get added in to food, so when they process the food they may add extra sugar into it or add corn syrup or things like that. And then the other way we get um, sugars in our food is if we add it ourselves, like you have your oatmeal and you put um, honey onto it. So that's how sugar ends up in our, in our food that has calories. Then there's non-nutritive sweeteners. These are things, um, another term for them is uh, artificial sweetener. These are not providing any calories to us. They don't have carbohydrate, they don't provide calories. So when you think of um, Splenda, this is a, an artificial sweetener. The other part that they're non-nutritive is they're not giving us vitamins and minerals either. They just basically are no calories, no nutrition. You know, you just take them in and they're sweet. That's about it. So why do we use artificial sweeteners? I think most people know why we use them. We're either trying to control our weight because they don't have calories. Uh, if you have diabetes or you're trying to keep blood sugars down, people go to artificial sweeteners to keep sugars down. And then uh, cavities, you know, if you eat sugar that feeds the bacteria in your mouth, um, artificial sweeteners don't cause cavities, so people turn to them for that. So the non-nutritive, I'll go over those first. Those are artificial sweeteners. These are the most common that we have uh, in America that, that are on our store shelves. You've got saccharin, aspartame, acesulfame K, um, sucralose, stevia, and then monk fruit and neotame are in our food systems. They're just not as common, so I'm not going to talk about them today. I'm just going to highlight the, the most common ones. So first off is saccharin. I'm sorry about the slides. are a little split there. Um, saccharin is sweet and low. So most people see that in any coffee shop that you go to, right? It's the oldest longest established artificial sweetener. It's been around 1879. It's 300 times sweeter than sugar. So a lot of sweetness coming from the sky. If you use a packet, you know how it really tends to amp up um, whatever you put it into. It passes through the body with no calories. That's what makes it non-nutritive. We don't absorb anything from it. It doesn't contribute any calories. So as I go through all these alternative sweeteners, we'll go through how sweet they are, you know, how long they've been around, and um, if they have calories, and then I'll also go through the research. 
So saccharin, a lot of times people ask me, you know, I've heard it causes brain tumors or it causes cancer. And there were some studies that were done back in 1977 when they were determining, should we keep it on the market, should we pull it off the market? Um, and what they found is that in rats it caused bladder cancer. But that bladder cancer and the mechanism of how it works doesn't translate over to humans because our um, physiology of our bladders are different than those of rats. And the chemistry of our urine is also different. So the way it created cancer in a rat cannot happen in a human. Um, and they've done studies to try to repeat that in humans and it just doesn't happen. So there is evidence about that, but it just doesn't seem like it's going to translate over to, to us as humans. So a lot of other studies have been done and there just isn't a link between saccharin and cancer. Okay, so if you hear it or you see it, it's just, it hasn't been proven. Um, aspartame is equal, another common one we see in our coffee shops. And then NutraSweet, if you ever see a little swirl on the back of packages that says NutraSweet, it was more common back in the 90s. Um, that's aspartame. It was discovered back in 1965, so it's been around a while, but not quite as long as saccharin. Um, and it's about 160 to 220 times sweeter than sugar. So again, very, very sweet uh, sweetener. It does provide calories. But with the equal that you get in a packet, it's not 100% aspartame. It's got other like bulking agents in it. So you're getting a very, very, very small portion of actual aspartame and a lot of filler. So even though it has calories, you've got such a small amount that it really doesn't contribute calories. Does that make sense? So when you get a packet, you may have like a fraction of true solid aspartame and you have like bulking agent like dextrose or something else to make it volume so you can actually see it. But, so really when you get a packet of equal, it doesn't really have any calories in it. Um, it's a combination of an amino acid, phenylalanine, and aspartic acid. And the reason I mentioned that, have you guys ever seen on the back of a package of equal or something that has it, it says known to contain um, phenylalanine? Have you guys seen that? Somebody like Brian? I think you said you have. Has anybody else seen that? So people get scared when they see that, and the reason that is put on packages is there are people that are born with a hereditary disorder that they cannot metabolize phenylalanine, which is an amino acid that's present in all kinds of foods. Any protein is going to have phenylalanine. Um, they, can't, they can't metabolize it, and it ends up building up and causing uh, mental retardation. So, but those people know they have it when they're born at birth, because we're all tested uh, in the hospital as infants, and you have to follow a very special diet. And those warnings are on the packages for that. Anybody in here, you would already know you have it, and you would be watching it since you were an infant. So, not a concern for everybody uh, that's, you know, doesn't have PKU. One thing to keep note is you can't use equal in baking. It actually breaks down when you cook with it. Um, it's, not, it's not heat stable. So, another concern that people kind of bring up is that this methanol that's produced by aspartame, um, when we break down aspartame, you end up with phenylalanine, aspartic acid, and methanol. But I think what needs to be pointed out is the methanol that's made from drinking like a liter of diet soda is significantly less than what's naturally found in juice, okay? So if you drank a liter of diet coke, you would get 55 milligrams of methanol, it's a low amount. A liter of juice would give you 680. It's naturally occurring, it's not some level that we can't work with or metabolize, okay? So if you've ever heard that there's an issue with that, it's, it's not founded on, on anything that we're, we're concerned about. In terms of research, again, brain tumors um, were found back in the 1980s. Um, but when you actually look at when people started consuming aspartame versus when brain tumors started to increase in America, brain tumors started to increase long before aspartame was even in our food system. And the National uh, Cancer Institute is the one that pointed out when this research study came out, they said, hey, no, wait, brain cancer started going way before aspartame was, we were even eating it. And they tried to point out in that study that the people that were age 70 and plus, that they had, you know, brain tumors, the highest um, instance of them, but they had the smallest amount of time to even consume that product because they were older. Um, they weren't consuming aspartame their entire life. So again, their exposure to aspartame was very limited. These brain tumors were caused by something else. So they really refuted that study. It wasn't very well done. Um, Again, there's some evidence that people say, hey, it makes neurological issues, behavioral issues. There isn't any evidence to support that aspartame does that. Children with ADD are told to avoid um, aspartame or you know, equal. Again, no research to support um, that affects their behavior or their cognition. Um, and then individuals that have seizure, or seizure disorders, there's some you know, rumors going around they need to avoid it. Again, there's no evidence to really support that. So in terms of acceptable safe intakes, Recommendations, um, 
in terms of aspartate, 19 cans of soda a day is a safe amount that if you drink that every single day for the rest of your life, you would not be going over what's considered safe that they haven't seen health issues with. Um, or that would be 107 packets of equal a day. Again, something not realistic that you're going to ever consume that much. So it's very hard for anybody to even get to a level that's considered concerning. Okay? So acesulfame K, um, the K actually stands for potassium. These are sweeteners that you probably don't see. I don't think I've seen those out in the market probably ever, where you actually see acesulfame Ks in like a lot of diet sodas or chewing gums. Um, so it's a product that you may not recognize. It's been around since the 1960s, and it's about 200 times sweeter than um, table sugar, which is sucrose. And again, it passes through the body with no calories. We don't recognize it um, as nutrition. So just for structure, I don't know if I was injured, it's organic acid and potassium. That's what the K stands for, it's potassium. So you can use it in baking, it's in a lot of sodas, like I said, it's in a lot of products. So if you turn your label over, you'll see acesulfame K in pretty much anything that's kind of sweet. Um, again, it's been studied, it's used in over 90 countries, and no one has ever come out with um, either a case where somebody came to the hospital or had an issue where they had cancer or they had tolerance issues. It's been used very, very widely, no real outcomes suggesting that it's harmful to the body. Um, sucralose, though, probably one of the most popular sweeteners, and at one point in time it was my, my um, non nutritious sweetener of choice, um, but I'll kind of go over why that's changed. Splenda, again, is the common name. Um, this is, it's very surprising, and my, my vision of this has changed in the past year um, with the new research study that's come out. Discovered back in 1976, and the reason people like it is it's made from sugar. Okay, they start with a sugar molecule. Um, I'll kind of explain here. Start with a sugar molecule, and they switch out some of the hydrogen atoms for chlorine atoms, and your body doesn't recognize it as sugar, and it's able to pass through without even absorbing it. So people like it because it comes from something that we know. It's not these weird chemicals that we don't know what they are. It's very popular. It's, it's super sweet. When you get Splenda in the packet, it's only a little fraction of Splenda and it has a lot of bulking agents again um, because it's 600 times sweeter than sugar. So if it was solid um, sucralose in there, you would be like bowled over. So there's other things in that packet. Um, again, not metabolized, doesn't have calories, and um, it has been promoted to be heat stable. You can use it in baking. You've seen Splenda for baking. It's like half sugar, half, half sucralose. Um, you know, so that's why people like it. You can use it in almost anything. Um, what's interesting is the Journal of Toxicology um, came out about a couple months ago, maybe a year ago, with a whole bunch of new evidence on Splenda. So Splenda was, you know, touted as this great thing, it's sugar, but what we're finding out is that it doesn't just pass through your body and not have any effect on it. Yes, it has no calories, but it's having all these other effects on our health. Um, the first is that it, while it doesn't have calories and sugar, it's affecting the way our glucose and our insulin and hormones that have to do with our insulin work in our bodies, which the whole reason we pick alternative sweeteners is to not raise our blood sugar, to not cause diabetes and that kind of thing. Um, the thing that strikes me most and really convinced me to not want to consume Splenda is that it affects the healthy bacteria in your gut. And I know both of you guys came to the probiotics talk and we know how important um, the bacteria in our gut are for our health. It's like 70% of our immune system is the bacteria in our gut. And when you consume Splenda, they, they studied it in rats, and uh, even some in humans, um, they saw that those healthy bacteria, the good kind, were reduced by, by consuming Splenda. And then when they took it away, even three months later, they had not returning normal levels of, of healthy bacteria in their gut. And the bad part is, is it didn't affect the unhealthy bacteria that we have in our guts. So it's really, you know, that healthy bacteria we don't want to affect by taking in a sweetener. So that, to me, was the reason I decided I didn't want to use Splenda anymore. It really resonated with me. Um, in addition, there's some beginning evidence that it might affect the way that drugs are absorbed. So if you're taking a medication, there are some medications that it might affect the way that our bodies metabolize that, that drug different than what your doctor was hoping. Um, again, there's some interesting new research, not a ton, but you know, suggesting that. And then um, some other studies came out saying that it doesn't hold up in heat. And that's what we're using Splenda for, is that, you know, put it in your baking, put it in your oven. It's not seeming to hold up as well as we thought it did. So, kind of scary. Um, again, like I said, it was my sweetener of choice, and now I've decided to, um, to back away from that. So, um, Stevia, again, is one of those things. Does anybody here use Stevia? Yeah, it's pretty popular. I think that people have gone from Splenda to now Stevia because it's considered a natural um, alternative sweetener. Most people know it as Trivia, or there's some other ones out there as well. Um, it's 250 times sweeter than sugar, and that's the stevia extract. Um, the way we get the extract is we take the plant leaves, 
and then we break it down to get these two extracts that are listed here. The process that's required to do that takes over 40 steps. It's not the natural plant that um, in the past uh, people have said, oh, stevia's been around for many, many years and we've been using it in ancient Chinese society or wherever. This extract is not that. Um, so when you look on the, um, in supplement stores and you see the stevia extract leaves, completely different, uh, or sorry, the stevia leaves, the extract is very, very different from that. Um, so when you look down here at the bottom of this slide, we start out with leaves, you dry them, you get them to a powder, that's where we really should stop. Between the powder and that packet is 40 steps of processing, so it's not natural. So the conception that's out, this, this idea that stevia is this wonder thing, it's a plant, and it's so natural. The, the leaves absolutely are, and you can use them to sweeten your tea, they're not as sweet as that extract. So I would strongly encourage you, if you're a huge fan of stevia, it's really no different um, than a lot of the chemicals that we saw before. Okay, it's a patented process. Um, so all these other, and in addition, there's a lot of processes that goes on, it's not just the extract. They put it with all these all other bulking agents, okay? So when they put, like Truvia has um, a sugar alcohol, they make that sugar alcohol from corn that's genetically modified. Which, I mean, if you want to stick away from GMOs, they're not good for us. So it's not just the extract that you're getting in your, in your package. Maltodextrin is derived um, from corn that's also mixed with uh, stevia and the pure edia. And then um, the last one down there is mixed with agave nectar. So it's not just this natural thing. So this is the one I think most people are going to be surprised by because again, it's marketed and touted as this natural item. And the leaves absolutely are a natural source of the sweetener. We'll talk about that in a minute. So um, sugar alcohols is kind of a mix between non nutritive and um, Nutritive, so sugar and honey, and we've got our, um, our non nutritive sweeteners. This is kind of the middle ground. Um, you might have seen them, they always end with a tall. So you've got sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol. They're usually found in like gums. If you turn over your gum wrapper, you'll see them. Um, sugar free candies, that's a place that people see them. A lot of people with diabetes use them because they have about a half, a half to a third of the same amount of calories or sugar as sugar does. So they're a way to reduce the amount of sugar in a diet with somebody with diabetes. Um, the pros of them, again, they don't have as many calories. Um, the sugar that we do get from them is a little bit slower absorbed than um, table sugar, and it doesn't cause tooth decay. So if you, know, you have kids eating things, you know, it's a way to cut back on their tooth decay. But the, pro the con, I don't know if anybody's ever eaten a whole box of the sugar-free candy. I still have a half a box. Yeah. <laughs> I have, I've actually had a lot of clients that when, you know, working with diabetes, um, that will tell me they ate the entire box and then they had massive diarrhea. Because again, the reason it's effective for not being as high in sugar or, or carbohydrate is because it's not fully um, broken down in our guts. So it causes a lot of water to rush to your gut, which causes diarrhea. Um, and with that, you get bloating gas. So there isn't the evidence behind um, these sugar alcohols that's kind of wondering, like, does it cause cancer, does it not cause cancer? Yeah? The cancer is one thing, but why do they get to zero out the regular carbohydrates on the label. What's that? Where when it has sugar alcohol, it doesn't count them as real carbohydrate. Because it may not contribute enough. So when you look at a label, if it's anything less than five, they can say it's zero. Um, if it's trans fat and it's less than um, half a gram, they can say it's yeah. zero. Sometimes they'll like subtract them out where it's like yeah. 20 grams of regular carbs and then yeah. 10 so, grams and it's like less right. than 10. Right, and it may also be there's fiber in that product, which they can kind of like say net carb is probably yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And that's because there's, um, we look at the load on the, on the blood sugar and it has to do with carbohydrates. So again, these fall half, they have less sugar than regular table sugar. But it may not be enough to contribute um, to count on the label. So, or it could be again a factor of fiber and that net, that net carb. Um, so again, these are not quite as bad. They're like a stepping stone to kind of reducing sugar intake. They don't have again that research that says hey they cause cancer. Or it's kind of controversial. Um, but again, they haven't been re it's researched as much. So, like I said, they're kind of a stepping stone. Um, what's interesting about all these artificial sweeteners, I can't really say if they cause cancer or not. Right now, we, we don't see in the research that they do, but what I can say is the amount of how our weight has gone up. A BMI is your height to weight ratio, and we have all these artificial sweeteners around, but why is everybody still gaining weight? I mean, like, if you think about it, we're all using all these artificial sweeteners, but we're still having issues with our weight, and they're not even contributing to calories. So this graph here is the new products that are artificial sweeteners. The number of people that are consuming artificial sweeteners is going up 
and so is our BMI. Okay? So what, what's going on here? This is really interesting. Um, what's, what's happening is we have a connection between our gut and we eat food in our mind. So when you eat sugar, normal table sugar, or you have honey, it's sweet and it has calories with it. So those messages sent to your brain, and a lot of things happen in the brain when you consume food, and it sends a message to your body, I have calories, I have something sweet, I'm satisfied. When you eat an artificial sweetener, you have the sweet, no calories, it goes to your brain and your brain's like, what do I do with this? I, I don't know, I, I sh maybe I should send a message that I'm full, but I'm not really sure. So it doesn't send that message to tell you, I'm satisfied, I'm satiated. It doesn't happen. Over time, this process leads us to not be able to properly metabolize and to feel satiated, so you end up overeating. And this little mouse here, because they do a lot of studies with these artificial little sweeteners with mice, I think it's so cute. He's sitting there with his chocolate, where's my Diet Coke? It just makes you crave more sweets by using the artificial sweetener. So they go against what they're trying to prevent in the first place, which is weight gain, high blood sugars, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. They're actually doing the exact, they're leading you to the same place, okay? It's really, the mind-gut connection is crucial. So does that make sense what happens when you eat the artificial sweeteners? Um, not to mention, like I said, you end up with all these health conditions you're trying to prevent in the first place. And keep in mind, remember I talked about um, Splenda affects your healthy um, bugs in your gut. They help you break down food. It affects the way your body metabolizes nutrients by taking in those artificial sweeteners. So what can we do? Nutritive sweeteners, that would be things that have calories. This would be something I try to push you towards. Um, we'll talk about how to do it in moderation. But table sugar, turbinado sugar, honey, um, pure maple syrup, and agave syrup. And there are goods in this section and there are bads. So let's talk about which ones are good and bad. So table sugar, you've got 50% fructose, 50% glucose. For a tablespoon, you've got 48 calories. Um, if you count carbs, you've got 12 and a half carbs. The thing about it, though, is highly refined. You don't see this in nature, just falling off trees. It has to be really processed, and in that processing, you lose a lot of good nutrients, vitamins and minerals um, that normally would have been present. So you're just getting calories and carbohydrate from table sugar. So it's not really the best choice. It might be better than some of the alternative sweeteners, but again, not the, the best choice of all these. Turbinado sugar, something like sugar in the raw, if you've ever seen those packets, the only difference between it and table sugar is that it has a little bit of the molasses less left because it's processed just a little bit less. Um, pretty much the same calories, very, very small trace amounts of certain minerals. Again, not a superstar. Um, honey, though, on the other hand, is one of the natural sweeteners that I would encourage you to consider and think about. Um, honey is made from bees. They, they take the nectar from a whole bunch of plants and they bring it to their little hive and they put some of the enzymes that they make to help break down the sugars in the honey and they put it in the hive and as they flap their wings it helps um, remove some of the liquid and helps concentrate it to that thick syrup that we call honey. So it's very natural, not a lot of processing involved. Um, and it also contains um, different antioxidants depending on where you get it from. So there's over I think, 300, yeah, 300 different varieties of uh, honey depending on where they come from in the United States because you have different plants and flowers and grasses that they make the honey from. So, um, so in terms of a nutrition profile, it's got fructose, glucose, and maltose, and a little bit of water. So it's a mixture of a lot of different sugars. Um, and it's a little bit sweeter than sugar, so you might need to use less than table sugar. Even though it has more calories, people tend to use a little bit less honey than they might of um, sucrose. And with that calories, we're getting a little bit of acids, small amount of protein, nothing to add to the brain, but we're getting some of that and some minerals. Um, and in addition to that, you get phytochemicals, which are antioxidants, help you know reduce inflammation. Um, in addition to that, pre and probiotics come in honey. So instead of taking away the healthy uh, bacteria in our gut, like some of those artificial sweeteners do, it actually helps those healthy bacteria grow in our gut to help us be um, have a better immune system and be healthier. Um, if you guys drink fermented milk, which is a really good source of probiotics, adding honey to it can really help that be more effective. Um, and then in addition to that, antimicrobial properties, meaning helps keep bacteria levels down. You know how people eat it when they're sick? Helps coat their throat. Um, there's actually some antimicrobial function um, to honey besides just coating your throat. And an interesting study came out looking at over-the-counter um, cough medicines for kids, honey, and then taking nothing. And honey outperformed over-the-counter cough medicines. And over-the-counter cough medicines actually have a lot of really negative effects that children you don't want to have. So this is a natural way um, to help remedy a cough. Um, and in addition to that, um, you can also use honey and it helps products become more moist when you're cooking. 
Um, so that's a benefit. But a lot of people take it because they say it helps release, relieve their seasonal allergies, but there actually isn't a lot of evidence to support that. And I kind of was surprised myself because um, I'm an allergy sufferer um, and I made a point to buy local honey, but there isn't a lot of evidence to support it. But again, there's a lot of other benefits to honey that if you take it for that reason, you know, it's just an added bonus if it does seem to help you. But um, not a lot of evidence. What's that? It's, it's delicious. It's yeah. You just eat it by the spoon. You don't put it in. Yeah, and it's just natural. There's not process. There's not 40 steps to make honey. Okay. Um, one caution is if you do have children or children around you that are less than one year, you cannot give them honey because of the risk for botulism. It's not an issue for us. Our systems are able to handle it, but their immune systems are not up to snuff to be able to handle honey. Um, maple syrup is the other one that's probably a powerhouse um, of nutritional benefit in terms of a, a real sweetener, which is totally crazy because at one point, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't touch regular maple syrup with a 10-foot pole, but it actually has a lot of good benefit. Um, it's again a very natural process to make it. You just boil down the sap from trees. There's not 40 steps involved in that. It's a mixture of glucose and fructose, so it's a 50-50 mix. Um, and it has a lot of natural minerals and nutrients in it. Um, we're talking about pure maple syrup, not, not the kind of Vermont maple that's heavily processed in corn syrup. Um, the cool part is it gives you 100% of manganese, um, which we use in um, metabolizing uh, cholesterol and a lot of different nutrient breakdown, we need that nutrient. So it gives you 100% uh, of that that you need in a day, which we get nothing from table sugar and nothing from artificial sweeteners. Um, and it has a lot of antioxidant uh, capacity similar to honey. And um, calorie-wise, it's 52 calories for a tablespoon, um, so you want to use it sparingly, but again, has some benefits to the sweetness. Agave syrup is one that a lot of people kind of are leaning towards. Um, but I would caution you to. Although it seems very natural, it comes from the same plant that we get tequila from, um, it is highly processed. There are a gazillion steps to make agave syrup. So while it comes from a plant, it's hardly even, even a shadow of the plant except for all the sugar from the plant. Um, there's none of those vitamins and minerals and antioxidants that we find in honey and maple syrup um, in agave. And it's 90% of fructose. An overload of fructose in a concentrated source like this can lead to fatty liver if you consume enough of it. Um, and a lot of people think high fructose corn syrup is so bad because it has so much fructose. This has more. So um, everybody talks it as a health food. The only place I would really suggest using it is if like a vegan really wanted to avoid um, honey because that's not vegan, they want to use agave syrup uh, as long as they can fit in their plan. But really it's not this health food that we all thought of as. Um, it's a one and a half times sweeter than sugar and it has about 60 calories, similar to honey. Um, for, for, for calories for a tablespoon. So again, it's just really highly refined. It's not as great as you think it is. Uh, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have any antioxidant content. So other natural sweeteners, fresh fruit putting into foods is really great. It comes with a lot of vitamins, minerals, fiber. Um, and then coconut palm sugars out there. Again, it's a little bit less processed an option. Not very common to find at the grocery store. So, um, or you could use the fresh ground stevia leaves. I uh, need to buy them in the supplement store. But those do provide sweetness. It's just not as extreme as the Truvia that we see on the shelf, but natural forms of sweet sweeteners. Um, what I think is important to mention with all of this, artificial sweeteners are something that I think, based on what we've gone over today, you can see they're not this great um, exchange in life. Nothing comes for free. So you get these free calories, but you're going to get some, you're going to pay in some way, shape, or form. Um, I have been a big supporter. I've worked in a lot of uh, diabetes clinics and work with patients that high blood sugars was a big fan of them, but the more and more research we look at, it's messing up how our bodies work and that natural system of recognizing calories. So I would suggest moving away. The sugar alcohols might be a stepping stone, a way to get some sweetness in it, but um, again, you want to get to a point, go ahead. Uh, you might go over this, but are there certain brands of honey that we should stay away from? That I would think a raw, local honey. So when they, um, when you take a honey product and manufacturer and they boil it down, you might lose some of those good probiotics. Remember we talked about if you heat something too high, it can kill the good bugs. Mm -hmm. So if you get a raw, any farmer's market, when I get honey, I'll get it from a local farmer's market where they just took it and they put it in the jar and it's just raw local honey. So, and it has the best flavor too. So, um, yeah, that's the, the suggestion. Look for, you know, if you're buying it in the store, you can buy an organic raw honey. And they sell it at Trader Joe's and they sell it at um, Sprouts, which are new or, or two grocery stores. And even Bonds probably has a local raw honey. Um, really good flavors, and depending on the plants they got it from, you can get all kinds of different flavor profiles. And they spend like $100 on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the are done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You lose your mind in that place in the honey section. Yeah. You can, you can, yeah, you can spend a lot of money, but I would suggest a local farmer's market. We are very 
blessed to live in San Diego and have access to that. Um, the Hillcrest Farmers Market, there are several places that sell it, um, as well as La Jolla Farmers Market.